You can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I'm trying to figure out to do this whole screen real quick. Does anybody know? I'm going to use. There we go. No, I got it. I got it right here. Um, okay, yeah, we're good to go. Okay, um, well, thanks for coming to, to listen to me today. I'm um, honored to be here. Thank you to Peter. Um, I'm honored to have a chapter in his great book, Radical Mycology. Um, so, anyway, today I'll be talking about, uh, I think the it's titled... Uh, psilocybin mushrooms and philosophy. I should have really called it psychedelic mushrooms and philosophy, but anyway, I'll be talking about that. Uh, what what are the sort of um, plan I have is just to say a little bit about myself and how I got into uh, psychedelic philosophy, as it were, via mushrooms. Um, then I'm going to speak a bit about Plato, um, a bit about what we call in philosophy phenomenology and metaphysics, a tiny bit of ethics, and then hopefully, if possible, um, so, uh, we can take some questions. I can take some questions. So, um, a little bit about myself then. So, I'm a, uh, I call myself a philosopher of mind and a metaphysician. I'm uh, finishing off my PhD at Exeter University. Before that, I was a philosophy lecturer in college in London for six years. Um, I was born in Sweden, though. But my father's British. Complicated story. Um, I, um, when I was teaching philosophy in, uh, in London, I was I was roped into teaching theology, philosophy of, my, uh, philosophy of religion, <clears throat> and it wasn't really my field, but you know I thought okay, why not? You know my sort of mid twenties, and um, I had to teach the arguments for the existence of God, you know, as part of part of philosophy of religion, and I, I so I taught you know the old uh, ontological, cosmological arguments, the uh, teleological argument, and so on. But there was one interesting. Um, it wasn't really an argument, but one interesting reason for believing in. Um, the, the metaphysical, that beyond the physical. And that was uh, from William James, the great American philosopher, William James, um, who said that, who argued that one could take, one could get a glimpse or an intuition of the metaphysical realm via psychedelic substances in his book, uh, The Varieties of Religious Experience, 1902, I think. And, that, and you know, and he said, you know, if you've had this experience, part of that experience is, that it's noetic, which means that um, you just know it's true um, having had the experience. And if you haven't had the experience, you don't know. But it's not an argument. It's just a, a sort of noetic experience. So as it wasn't an argument, there were no arguments to, uh, you know, to, to uh, refute it. It's just either you've had the experience or not. And I thought, OK, interesting. I've never had this experience, but, you know, might, might be the case. Anyway, one... Uh, one semester, I went back to Cornwall in the southwest of Britain where I lived. My parents lived at the time. And my brother. And um, I went for a walk with my brother in these fields uh, in one foggy Cornish morning. And um, my brother was an amateur mycologist. And he said, Peter, I think, uh, I think those are magic mushrooms. And I said, oh, really? Well, interesting, I thought, as I was just teaching this stuff from William James. And... Um, these were, you know, liberty caps. I'm sure most of you have heard of those. Uh, I think the Latin is uh, Salicybe semi lanceata, I believe. Anyway, so I thought, okay, I'll pick them. I picked about, you know, there's about 100 there. I've never found that many ever again in one place. But uh, I, picked, I picked them all, and I took them home, and then I checked on the, on the Internet to see whether they were sort of uh, fatal or not. But they seemed to be the right kind. So I, um, I dried them, and then I took them back to London. This is many years ago, mind. And, um, and then I took a small dose and I, uh, I went to the cinema and saw this amazing three dimensional film, you know. I realized later it wasn't three dimensional, but that was a, a, a <laughs> taste of the power of these, uh, you know, mushrooms, just to begin with. Um, and so a week later, I decided to take, you know, what's quite a high dose. Uh, not quite all of them, but, you know, most of those mushrooms. And, um, and that sort of changed my world. You know, I suddenly, re I mean, I, w I was always sort of mostly interested in the philosophy of mind, consciousness. But uh, having taken those mushrooms, suddenly I realized, wow, you know, so much more consciousness than I had even imagined. 
I, I you know, completely, almost literally blew my mind. Um, anyway, so that's how I got into psychedelic philosophy. And, um, and then I looked into the literature, you know, there's William James and there's, um, uh, Buck and, um, and, and some others. But there wasn't really, all actually, but there wasn't that much, relatively, there wasn't much, uh, philosophical literature on psychedelics. So I thought, okay, I'll, I better start, you know, examining this for myself. And, um, that's sort of what I've done. Then I wrote this book about it, Numenautics, was mostly about that, and uh, you know, I've, 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 you know, sort of done some conferences about it, and, and and that's why I'm here, I suppose. And then, yeah, Peter got in touch, and then I contributed that um, article in the book. Anyway, so that's how I became. And, and now moving on to Plato. So I looked at the literature, and I and I I read all about the so-called Eleusinian mysteries in ancient Greece. Um, this was a formal religious event in Eleusis, near Athens, um, held every year. There was a greater and the lesser mysteries. And um, all Greeks, anyone who could speak Greek, uh, was allowed to participate. Um, that included the great philosophers there, you know, Plato, Aristotle, so on. Uh, Socrates, no doubt. Anyway, interestingly, in these Eleusinian mysteries, um, Initiates, participants, had to fast and then had to drink a potion called the kaikion of a specific dose. After which, they suddenly had these heavenly experiences. And, um, and then I, you know, rereading Plato, having realized that, I, um, I read this in his book, The Phaedrus. And The Phaedrus, by the way, starts at the Elysos River, which is the location of the lesser mysteries. The mysteries, by the way, you weren't explicitly allowed to talk about them. That, that's why they were called the mysteries. Um, nonetheless, in the uh, Phaedrus, written about two and a half thousand years ago, Plato writes this. So here's a quotation. Um, we saw the blessed sight of vision and were initiated into that which is rightly called the most blessed of mysteries. We looked upon perfect apparitions, which we saw in the pure light, being ourselves pure, not entombed in this which we carry about with us and call the body in which we are imprisoned like an oyster in its shell. Also, in another book, an earlier book, the Phaedo, also known as On the Soul, he's, Plato says he wants to be known as one of the mystics. And after which, he then argues for the separation between the body and soul, dualism, substance dualism, and for the existence of a higher realm, the forms. Um, so, it seems that these... One can make the case, and people have, these, these experiences that Plato had um, at the Eleusinian Mysteries um, gave him the impetus to try to rationally argue for that which he um, had intuited through the Mysteries. And then, reading on, I discover this. Dr. Albert Hoffman, who discovered LSD in the 1940s, he himself argued that Plato and other ancient Greeks um, took this potion then, the kaikion, and in that, that kaikion, Alf Hoffman right, argues, um, contained ergot, uh, which is the sort of mushroom, uh, which is like parasitic on barley and wheat, um, which is the mushroom that um, LSD is derived from. Then, I put this together with this famous quotation from one of my favorite philosophers, Alfred North Whitehead. He's famous for saying this. Um, I try to remember it. The, the safest general category characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. In other words, Plato, all of Western philosophy really um, is going through Plato's questions. I mean, it's not that Plato had all the answers, but he was so broad in his questioning that we're sort of following up on that. Now, so you put two and two together and you realize, well, if psychedelics, if psychedelic mushrooms um, inspired Plato's philosophy, and if Plato inspired the Western canon, this, in effect, means that psychedelic mushrooms um, are the trigger of the whole of Western philosophy. There's the argument. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I mean, there's a million footnotes uh, to, to talk, go into there, but I won't, I don't want to bore you. But anyway, it's an interesting possibility, and quite likely. Um, <clears throat> now, part of... Part of what uh, Plato saw and what he's most famous for, really, I mean, if you've heard of Plato, I'm sure you've heard of Plato's cave. You know, there's prisoners in the cave, and they see shadows on the wall, 
um, that, uh, but they believe the shadows to be reality, reality. And then one prisoner, he escapes from his shackles, um, sees that the, his fellow prisoners are just seeing shadows, um, and then walks to the light and sees the real world, the tree, trees, the hills, and then ultimately the sun, which represents the form of the good. Um, and, and this represents in Plato's philosophy, um, this eternal realm of forms. So this is a, um, a metaphysical realm, which exists, wherein exists timeless, in other words, eternal um, forms, eidos, which, which are also known as universals. So these could be things like numbers, um, theorems like Pythagorean theorem. It can also be colors, um, um, concepts. So basically, everything we can think of, possibly think of, and more, is a form. But um, when they... They only become mental when they are actuated within us. But nonetheless, they, they're not produced by us. It's rather, we, as it were, sort of um, take them in. We, they ingress into us, as Whitehead says. So, interestingly, what the, the types of qualia, the types of phenomenology that we humans can experience, seem to be very much tied with our practical utility uh, and our evolution. So we see a certain, you know, small bandwidth of colors, small bandwidth of sounds. We can't see gravity. We can't see uh, many forces and many uh, spectrums out there. But we know they exist for other reasons. But our human, our general prosaic human consciousness seems to be very uh, filtering. You know, it seems to eliminate most of reality, that which really exists. And no one, no one will doubt that we only see a small spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum as colors, for example. Um, other animals, bees see ultraviolet, deer apparently see ultraviolet light, uh, we don't. But, you know, we have technology to sense it. Anyway, um, with regard to psychedelics, I noticed that, and through the literature, you realize that people, people often talk about the experience being ineffable, which is from William James again. In other words, there, there do not exist words that can describe the experiences that one has. Now, from my own experience as well, I realized that there are certain types of, ex ex even the word experience is not good enough, but certain experiences then um, that we have, which are completely alien, completely inhuman. Um, thus, you can't, you, can't, you can't talk about them, really. You can only talk about them negatively, like, as I am, you know, that there are no words that befit the experience. So another speculation is this. Could it be that psychedelics break down um, the normal workings of consciousness by disrupting the brain to allow for the influx of forms, hedonic forms, which are not usually, which are not practically necessary for the human? Um, perhaps they're more necessary for animals or for um, future eras. But nonetheless, um, could it be that the way to perceive these is through psychedelics. Um, interesting, Bertrand Russell, the great British philosopher Bertrand Russell, who, who believes in universals, this Platonic realm, um, he wrote a book called Logic and Mysticism, where he, um, he doesn't talk about psychedelics. I don't know why he's smoking his pipe, but I don't think it was any, anything psychedelic. But nonetheless, he had mystical experiences, he said. And um, he writes... Um, for example, this. this is a quotation from, from Mysticism and Logic. He writes, um, A truer image of the world is obtained by picturing things as entering into the stream of time from an eternal world outside. Both in thought and in feeling, even though time be real, to realize the unimportance of time is the gate of wisdom. Um, he also writes, Russell writes this. Now, I'm here bringing together mystic mysticism and psychedelics. I think they are... Uh, well, I think psychedelics are a type of mystical experience, not the only type, but one. But then again, there's not only one type of psychedelic experience, of course. Anyway, with regard to that, Russell writes this, quote, We may hope in a mystical illumination to see the eternal ideas, the forms, as we see objects of sense. And we, am we may imagine that the ideas exist in the heaven. These mystical developments are very natural, but the basis of the theory is in logic. And it is as based in logic that we have to consider it. So again, although it sounds very far flung, I mean, Bertrand Russell was, you know, probably the, the greatest uh, philosopher 
British, mm. certainly the last century. Um, he developed new forms of logic with Whitehead and others. And, um, and he took this idea seriously. Again, I can't go into the logical reasons for it at a conference, but again, I just give this so you can sort of, you know, if you're interested, you can, uh, you can look, look into it more. Um, forms, yeah. So there's a fascinating thing about, about, uh, about what psychedelics can provide. Um, personally, I do provide, I do, I personally prefer psychedelic mushrooms for a number of reasons. I mean, one reason is simply this, you know, um, if you pick your own, then you know, and if you're sure that they are the right ones, then you know that they are pure. They're not, you know, the danger with most drugs is that not the drug itself, but that they might contain impurities like washing up powder or something like that. But, you know, the good thing about, uh, Liberty Caps is that, um, they're very easy to, to find, distinguish. There are lookalikes, but if you know, you know. Um, um, they are, I, I believe, although I might be wrong, they're the second most potent psychedelic mushroom in the world. And luckily where I live, they surround me. I mean, the season's just started here. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and also the hunt for them is, is, is a good, good fun as well. And also, I mean, they last, you know, about six hours, whereas LSD is more like 12 hours. Um, I, I, I think 12 hours is pushing it really. I haven't got time for that. But, you know, six hours is, is acceptable. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you, there's, there's also, I mean, if you've got even less time, there's the businessman psychedelic DMT, of course, which is about 10 minutes <laughs> normal time. Uh, we can get into time in a moment. Um, uh, Salvia divinorum, uh, which is really interesting. I mean, I had the Salvia divinorum, div, you know, uh, sage, divinus sage experience once, smoked it, and it was just like 10 minutes, but it was just, it was like six hour mushroom trip squeezed into 10 minutes. And it was just, you know, too much. You couldn't take it in. It was just completely, uh, overwhelming. I mean, <laughs> pretty interesting, but, um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't do it. Well, I did it once again, but I, you know, I know also that was. A good <laughs> I don't really recommend it. I mean, mushrooms are perfect, I think, because, like I say, the pure six hours, mild but intense in different ways. You can really kind of weirdly think about what's going on instead of just being sort of a passenger in a rocket. Anyway, yeah. So that was the footnote. Um, Another interesting thing, time, yeah, time I mentioned. Okay, so time, you know, big, big question, what is time? Um, Bergson, the great French philosopher Henri Bergson wrote about time and consciousness, and it was Bergson that Aldous Huxley um, used in his famous book, The Doors of Perception, about mescaline, the mescaline experience, through, through via City Broad. Um, and a really interesting thing I noticed about time with uh, these mushrooms was that... Uh, you can't really, you know, 10 minutes on a mushroom trip can seem 10 hours, really, you know. Um, it really distorts the perception of time in strange ways. And the interesting thing about that, really, is that there's no absolute speed of time. And this is something Einstein showed as well, of course. But with, 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 uh, psych with psychedelic mushrooms, you actually get an intuition of that. You get a real intuition of the relativity of time. Uh, perhaps perceiving time at, level, at speeds that animals do. Um, another interesting thing about it is the specious, what's known as the, in philosophy, the specious present, something that, for example, Husserl talks about. What, when I ask you the question, what is the present, or what is the duration of the present, um, we know that it must have a duration, otherwise it would not exist. Um, but what is the extent of that? Interestingly, I noticed with my mushroom experiences that that species present can be extended. So you get a, more of the past and the present at once, as it were. So, for example, when, you, when I move my hand in a sort of um, <coughs> lemniscate, infinity symbol, it sort of becomes one object, one static object. So, in other words, um, you know, what is normally part of movement becomes a static object, bizarrely. And that makes you wonder, you know, well, again, is there an objective present? You know, what, what do we mean by the now? Uh, how do we measure that? Is consciousness necessary for creating the species present? I mean, arguably, it, it very much is. Probably differs among species again, upon, upon people and upon what people are taking. 
related to time, of course, is space. Um, I did my master's degree on um, Kant, Immanuel Kant, the great German uh, philosopher. And he, he's famous for, he's an idealist, so he's, he's famous for arguing that space and time are not real. They are just uh, mental projections. We, we don't um, perceive space and time. We create space and time, as it were, very basically. And um, again, with, I mean, he makes a good argument. I mean, it's, again, if you're not used to that kind of idealism, it sounds pretty crazy. But, I mean, it's very logical. He makes very good arguments for it, still argue today. Uh, I should say, again, Einstein was a Kantian. Kurt Gödel was a Kantian. Um, the great physicists took Kant very seriously. And um, with an ultimate psychedelic experience, it's, it's quite common in, in the literature to hear that time completely disappears. It's not that the present expands, it's that it simply goes away. Um, likewise with space. Um, space, uh, I mean... Kant, interestingly, was the first, in his very first book, to say that space might have more than three dimensions. I mean, the space we see, again, for Kant, is just what we create for our use. But as we know today, um, in order to reconcile, this is one reason why, you know, this, this is why we know that science hasn't yet reached an end point, if it ever, ever will, because, you know, as is common knowledge, uh, theories, relativity, and quantum physics do not cohere. Um, they are not consistent. They could be consistent, a number of physicists say, if we accept that space is more than three dimensions. Space of more than three dimensions is known as hyperspace. Interestingly, hyperspace is also um, important in, as a condition for certain resolutions in philosophy, in metaphysics. Um, I'll now introduce this philosopher who's still alive. He's, he's working still in San Diego at, I think, the age of 95. Called John Smithies, John R. Smithies. Fascinating chap, not that well known, so I, I note him down. Um, he, first of all, he's, he's part of the psychedelic history, really, because he and Humphrey Osmond, Humphrey Osmond was a psychiatrist who coined the term psychedelic in the 50s, and Aldous Huxley, who wrote Doors of Perception, this great British writer, they um, worked together and they, they had planned this amazing project called the Outsight Project, where they were going to get about just less, fewer than 100 people, uh, leading intellectual scientists, writers of, in the world, um, include uh, to take mescaline and write about it. And uh, they invited uh, philosophers like A.J. Ayer, H.H. H. Price, uh, de Cass, um, Jung, Carl Jung, um, Einstein, they were all invited to take a large dose of mescaline in the 1950s, mid-50s, and uh, they were going to get funding from the Ford Foundation. Unfortunately, they, in the last minute, they didn't get the funding, and it was the, it was the best thing that never happened in psychedelia. So what happened thereafter was that um, um, Timothy Leary sort of um, made it popular, and then as a result of that, because it became too popular for other reasons, um, it became criminalized, unfortunately, psychedelic. But anyway, John Smithies, part of this outside project, he argued that there, there exists basically two forms of space. There's physical space around us, as we see, he argued, and then there's mental space. So if you imagine a triangle, if you close your eyes and imagine a blue triangle, um, that mental qual, that, that uh, imagination, does have spatial qualities. It's got three sides, its angles add up to 180 degrees, it's got a boundary and so on. So he argued, Smithies argued, and William James did before him, in fact, um, that it's, Descartes was wrong to say that the difference between mind and matter is that matter is spatial and mind is non-spatial. Complete, complete rubbish. Um, but there, there are spatial qualities of the mental and there are spatial qualities of the physical. Now, the, the big question in philosophy of mind in, and in science really is how do these two spaces cohere? This is part of a, a broader problem called the hard problem of consciousness. How does matter, moving matter, uh, 
uh, relate to um, mentality. Anyway, um, Smithies, who, who himself took a lot of, uh, you know, mescaline, I think, um, he argued that physical space and each individual's mental space could be spatially contiguous in a hyperspace, in a, in a space of more than three dimensions, um, if we exclude time as a dimension. So that would be at least five dimensions, including time. Um, and he, he's got this great book called The Analysis of Perception, where he makes, very complicated, but he makes a great case for, for um, the necessity of hyperspace to explain the relation between matter and mind. It's pretty radical, but that's what makes it more interesting. Um, one thing I noticed again on mushrooms was this dimensionality of perception. I remember seeing this kind of uh, polygon with eyes closed, and um, it was it was 3D as you would see on a TV or computer screen. But then suddenly, boom! It becomes like properly 3D um, as we would see it in in the real world, as it were. And the, one of the problems with hyperspace, although it resolves a lot of issues in science and philosophy, um, it's very hard to, we can't really imagine it. I mean, you, can you imagine space of more than three dimensions, by which I mean, you know, up and down, left and right, forwards and backwards? Could there be a fourth dimension of space? I mean, it seems that that's just impossible to, to be. <laughs> It's almost, is it impossible to imagine? Well, if we look at the literature, there's this guy called Charles Hinton, who wrote The Fourth Dimension. He was living about, well, just a, he was, wrote this in the late 1800s. Um, he, he argued that, you know, you, with a lot of practice, you could actually imagine space of more than four dimensions. But, um, very difficult. Rudy Rucker, physicist who wrote about four dimensions as well, he said that, I think something like, after of 20 years of writing about this and thinking about this mathematically and whatnot, he had about, he had about 15 minutes of actually seeing or sensing four-dimensional space. Um, but interestingly, again, I have read reports. I haven't personally seen it, but I have read reports of people taking mushrooms and other psychedelics. Uh, who, who say they have experienced hyperspace on them. And if so, for most people, if someone were to experience that and didn't know what hyperspace was, they would just simply call it ineffable again. You know, it's like, well, I can't explain it, but it was like space, but not space. <laughs> Something like this. Um, so, fascinatingly, you know, we can talk about four dimensions of space theoretically. In mathematics, they do it all the time. Very simple. You need to have a fourth coordinate axis. But, but can you actually see it? If you can, does that give more credence to the whole theory? Possibly. Um, another interesting thing, I, so my PhD is on panpsychism, which is the view that mind is not merely a product, it's not only a product of the brain, but it exists in very basic forms in everything. So plants, um, mycelia, even molecules, atoms in a very basic sense. Um, interestingly, Paul Stamets, uh, you know, the great my mycologist, he also, well, he at least believes that mycelia is conscious. I remember reading that in, um, in, in one of his latest, later books. But anyway, panpsychism. So, Charles Hartshorn, a great um, American philosopher, he writes, one of the reasons that we, in the West we don't accept panpsychism is because we cannot imagine other forms of consciousness other than human, human consciousness. We, you know, to ask a question like, what would it be like to be a mushroom is completely unfathomable to, to most of us. And he calls this the prosaic fallacy. So interestingly, um, with, again, with, with the intake of psychedelic, psychedelic mushrooms, one then does access these really strange states of consciousness, which then allows at least more sympathy. It's not an argument for it, but it at least allows more sympathy for such kind of more radical theory of the mind. I should say in philosophy this, um, whatever the solution to the hard problem of consciousness will be, it's going to be radical, because nothing works at the moment. We're going to have to completely shift our assumptions to, um, to answer this question. 
Another aspect, I mean, there are so many aspects um, where, where, where psychedelic consciousness can inform philosophy, but I'll finish with um, ethics before questions, if you have any. So, an interesting thing about psychedelics and ethics is that uh, it's very common, it's very common to um, gain a greater appreciation um, of nature through psychedelics. I mean, I remember see, seeing a leaf and uh, thinking it's the most beautiful thing I've ever, that can ever exist on this, on, in this universe. You know, all the veins, all the hues of green and whatever, you know. After the experience, I mean, I've just, I suddenly gained this much, I always valued nature, but just, it almost took on kind of spiritual proportions, this loving of nature. So in that sense, I think psychedelics can certainly um, advance a, a greater sort of love of nature and, and sort of valuation of ecology. At the same time, however, um, Bertrand Russell and um, other philosophers like Octavia Pat say psychedelics also break down, you know, culture's morality, ideology, uh, customs. You sort of see your own culture from above as it were. And you question author authorities, you question what all your friends just take, take for granted. And in that sense, it's somewhat akin to Nietzsche's philosophy, who, who sort of really you know, is famous for questioning Western morality. So, so the sort of paradox there with I found is that in one sense, uh, psychedelics can increase what most people would call morality in terms of ecology. At the same time, it can lead to a kind of nihilism as well. Uh, not less valuation than nihilism, but rather uh, a nihilism in terms of um, not believing in absolute morals anymore. So, um, yeah, so that's just a, the tip of the iceberg of, of questions and possibilities uh, that psychedelics through mushrooms have given to me. I mean, you can spend your life looking at it, all of these questions. And I think that, um, look, I mean, when I talk about this stuff in university, I'm at Exeter University in the UK, uh, all the other staff, all the other philosophers, you know, members of staff are really, really fascinated by it, you know, because they are these bizarre states of consciousness. But a lot of them are a bit scared to wade in, as it were, because, of course, they are still illegal. And uh, there's still a, still a bit of a faux pas to talk about them. They're still taboo. But I think that's changing. Um, the laws are, are get, of prohibition are slowly sliding away in Britain and Europe, as, as well as America, of course, as well as the rest of the world, it seems, generally speaking. So um, I, I foresee a great uh, new phase in philosophy, at least the philosophy of mind, where we'll take these psychedelic experiences um, intellectually seriously once more. Hopefully that will move us on a bit because we've, we're a bit stuck in a rut as as regards consciousness anyway. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of um, that's my uh, interest here. Um, and I'll finish there and open up for questions if you like. So, any questions? I can't hear you if you've got a question. I can't see your arms either. Can you sort of shout? Yes, I think so. Can you hear me? Just about. It's very loud, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So... In A Brief History of Western Thought, Bertrand Russell writes that since Einstein, there have been no objects, only events. Do you think this line of thinking could be an informative one for finding either breaking past the dualistic discard thinking or finding the hyper dimension? Absolutely. Absolutely, I do. I mean, you know, Bertrand Russell was a, was a student of Alfred North Whitehead. And Alfred North Whitehead is the father of process philosophy, which is exactly that, you know, the notion that um, objects don't exist, but events, processes 
exist. And the famous psychonaut Terence McKenna has written that the philosopher to look at with regard to psychedelics is Alfred North Whitehead. And he himself tries to sort of implement Whitehead's philosophy with regard to this. I've also written two, essay, uh, two, two, two essays, really, on Whitehead and psychedelic philosophy, where I try to integrate it as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, think, um, I think this is... I mean, Whitehead was a panpsychist, so that links to what I was saying with regard... And Hartshorn, who came up with the prosaic fallacy, was Whiteheadian. So, also, Whitehead wrote about... Um, dream space so when I was talking about phenomenal space um, there's an interesting essay by Whitehead called I think it's called Uniformity and Contingency boring title, it's really interesting and it's about dream space you could then shift that to psychedelic space because for me psychedelics, you know, dreams are like really boring psychedelic experiences generally speaking um, and yeah, so, so the, the whole, I mean, it's a vast topic, but absolutely, the whole, the best approach to psychedelics, in my view, is, uh, yeah, process philosophy, taking events from objects to be ontologically fundamental. Thank you. But, uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> have a look at my essay, um, The Great God Pan is Not Dead, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, and... Psychedelic phenomenology. Yeah, so I go into the details there. If I went into the details here, I'd lose everyone immediately. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to uh, this last idea you said that um, this potential breakdown of morality, I think, is used as an argument against uh, the more uh, accepted use of psychedelic. So could it be argued that um, it's not so much a breakdown of morality, more that um, these substances allow uh, for the occasion of acknowledging that there are things that are, can be considered morally abhorrent, um, but n not that we would necessarily act on them or anyone who is in uh, the range of normal uh, mental health would necessarily act on them, but just have the experience of acknowledging that these abhorrent, morality, morally abhorrent states exist. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, I mean, even even rationally, sort of coming to a meta-ethical, uh, uh, non-realist moral position um, doesn't mean you will you will act on. Um, I mean, you you could not you could be a complete nihilist and have no desire to kill people or rape people or anything like this. You know, that's completely separate. Uh, thing. So, so yeah, I think that, um, I mean, and the case, I mean, we look at Octavio Paz, for example. I mean, he was, he won the Nobel Prize, um, great writer. Um, he, he, from a Nietzschean perspective, he argued that psychedelics bring one to nihilism, or not, nihilism means so many things, or rather takes one away from absolute morality. Um, and in one sense, from another moral point of view, you could say that's a moral stance. In other words, you become less judgmental, you know, and you're sort of more accepting of others, other, other viewpoints and so on. But of course, that's from the perspective of thinking that being accepting and tolerant is morally good. Right? So, so, I mean, you could even question that. But um, it's certainly, I think, I think what it basically does is, it, I mean, just like philosophy of mind, it, it, it sort of gives you a a completely different perspective and so it makes you question everything you previously believed and I think that also applies to morality as well it just makes you think is this morality with which I've been brought up um, and my peers believe is that actually I mean what's that really based on um, I don't know if that experience is that common but it certainly certainly does happen and, and like I say Bertrand Russell mysticism and logic writes about it as well so it's it's a very interesting uh Paradox, but then again, there are a lot of people in the psychedelic circles who say that um, you know psychedelics make you more moral. But then the question is, well, what do you mean by moral? Which morality are you talking about there? And then if you if if you think there's only one morality, then that's sort of what psychedelics can take you out of. Does that make you more or less moral according to what morality? Well, yeah, it's complicated.
Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, you talked a little bit about um, the mystic's use of hallucinogens. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about pre-colonial um, hallucinogen use in Europe. Yesterday we had someone speak uh, who talked a lot about indigenous uses of psilocybin in Mexico. Could you tell us a little bit more about what it looked like in Europe before colonization? Uh, you just broke up there. Before? Oh, colonization. Okay. Uh, well, and by colonization, what what um, what time are you talking about? I mean, you mean sort of last few hundred years or before that? Well, I'll sure, tell you sure. what. Why don't you give us a timeline? I think colonization is too. <laughs> well, okay. The reason I ask is because of the Vikings. So you know, like the Vikings were colonizers. So of course, they colonized more than a thousand years ago. But they, they colonized your country, but they were unsuccessful. <laughs> so they didn't really colonize it. I think they stayed there for 20 years in Vinland, Wineland, which is, uh, I think it was New England. Anyway, um, so, yeah, um, there, there's a tradition, the Vikings, I mean, so I'm half Swedish, and I, I'm uh, allegedly related to uh, certain Vikings, like uh, like um, Sp uh, Sven Falkbeard and Harold Bluetooth and uh, Ragnar Lufbrook according to my grandfather's genealogy book, which I completely believe. Um, the, the, the Vikings, the Vikings um, were known, it's not my field, but this much I do know, uh, the Vikings were known to see the gods when they drank certain beers. So there is that. Um, interestingly, They've they found in Danish tombs and Swedish tombs, Scandinavian tombs, they, they, there's a lot of, they found a lot of witches, what we'd probably call witches today, or sorceresses, or uh, um, the wise women um, of, the, of the Viking Age and before. And they were often buried with staffs, uh, metal kind of wands. But interestingly, they've also discovered cannabis seeds with a lot of these women, these witches. And um, so... It's quite feasible that those cannabis seeds were, you know, burnt, and ca cannabis is a hallucinogen, of course. So there's probably a history there. Arguably, that when the uh, Vikings came to Britain, they invaded Britain around 800 to 1000 AD. Um, they brought this kind of, uh, you know, um, chemical spirituality, as it were. And there is, uh, arguably, there's there's this history of witchcraft in England, um, where, uh, like, henbane, these herbs are used which are psychoactive. Even the whole, you know, I won't get into details, but the witch's um, broomstick uh, uh, allegedly uh, was anointed with certain um, uh, certain plants, psychoactive plants, and, um, and taken, let's say, by the witches. So it is alleged. But, uh, again, it's not my field. Um, but with regard to the Greeks, uh, going back, I mean, I spoke about the Eleusinian Mysteries, and, and that was a form, the, the most formalized religious event in ancient Greece. Um, it was closed down by the Roman emperor, the Christian Roman emperor, Theos Theodosius, in the 5th century AD. But the Neoplatonists, um, well, there's one really interesting philosopher called Proclus. He was the la last Neoplatonist. And he said, he alleged that the mysteries um, went underground after the uh, Christian, pro, you know, prohibition on uh, these mysteries. And he traveled the world, Proclus, and um, partook of these mysteries. So, but, but before, before the Eleusinian mysteries, there were Dionysian festivals, which became the sort of Bacchic uh, orgies later on in, in Rome, in Roman um, lands. But... It's well known that the wine, you know, wine in ancient Greece was psychoactive as well and had to be watered down all the time. It was extremely strong stuff. And so so from the very start of these Dionysian festivals, um, which then became formalized really as the Eleusinian Mysteries, um, there was always this drug use, um, which basically took you out of everyday consciousness and 
and gave you different, you know, um, other states of mind. Um, and as I argued, it was these other states of mind which, with which the Greeks were so familiar that Plato tried to sort of formalize into, you know, try to sort of rationally back up. But um, there's, there's a great book um, called um, Pharmacon, Pharmacon by Renella. Written, I think it was published in 2012, uh, which goes into the detail there. I recommend it. And not to mention, of course, the Soma in the ancient Vedas in India. And there's a lot of literature on that. Matthew Clark's new book's really good. Um, he, he argues, actually, that the Kaikyon potion and the Eleusinian mysteries wasn't ergot, but was um, um, other, like a sort of um, ayahuasca analog. I mean, this is all up for debate. Most people now... Most, uh, well, many, half academics, I think, agree that the Kaikian was psychedelic. The question is, what, which psychedelic? But Hoffman's argument was this. Next to the Eleusinian Mysteries were the Rarian Plains, which grew barley right next to the uh, Mysteries. And barley, of course, is commonly infected with ergot. So, yeah, the, that debate's still out there. There are other uh, academics who don't believe that there was any psychedelic in it as well. Uh, that just seems implausible when you read... Um, about um, phantasms and uh, pure light and thinking the body is separate from the soul and so on. But yeah, I mean, like psychedelics, I mean, psychoactive drugs were very common in, in, ancient, in ancient Greece and um, ancient Scandinavia, no doubt. Um, I'm not really sure how to formulate this, but uh, uh, I guess it's kind of asking about the context of psychedelics in society um, and like political consequences. Um, so I guess we have kind of like the third wave or psychedelic renaissance happening and there's more research going on. Um, and this is all happening within the context of, uh, you know, a capitalist uh, global society. and it's, I'm thinking about how, um, you know, we're learning more about the human mind um, and understanding more about consciousness, but when you offer capitalism's key to human consciousness, it's probably not going to do very great things with it. Um, and already we're seeing, um, you know, like the company uh, Compass Pathways investing in psychedelic research, um, and they're not involved in anything very good um, across the world. But, um, yeah, I'm just wondering how do we maybe think about the issues uh, surrounding the integrity of like, the psychedelic movement moving forward and um, ensuring that it's used for consciousness, uh, um, for liberation of consciousness rather than kind of the oppressive potentials of like, active um, use. You know, I just think about like the culture and use of alcohol, particularly in the state. And, you know, cannabis has the potential to be, you know, very spiritual for some people and for other people can be very escapist and numbing. So I'm just worried about how that would progress in a very bad way for society. Yeah. Um, well, that's a broad, broad question. I mean, uh, it, I mean, very, it's interesting to compare the six, 1960s with the present because um, whereas in the 60s, psychedelics were all about peace and love, um, pacifism, today there's talk that the U.S. Uh, Air Force might be able to use psychedelics and microdose states to enhance their fighting capability. Uh, so, and also, of course, microdosing generally um, is a way of making workers more efficient at their jobs. If, if microdosing is actually, if it actually works, and it's not just a placebo. Uh, I know Imperial College are doing a study on it now, and um, as Thorsten Passy's got a book coming out on it soon, which I've, I'm actually typesetting, believe it or not. But anyway, um, yeah, with regard to um, capitalism and psychedelics. <laughs> just, um, I suppose one thing is, you know, the more people who who take psychedelics, I suppose the less 
I don't know about this. I would speculate that the less they become concerned with material possessions and more with metaphysical questions and ecology, or maybe that's just me. <laughs> but um, you'd think that with increased use, people's interest would shift. That might shift away from uh, very materialist systems you have, especially there in the US. Of course. I mean, I'm half Swedish, and half Sweden's almost like, you know, semi-communist. So it's going to yeah, I'm not really used to the sort of uh, the societies in which you 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 poor people. You know? I mean, you have to pay for it, right? I and mean, that's just unbelievable. So, um, it's hard, in a way, I, I, it's hard for me to 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 be as emotional about it as you 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 must be, because it doesn't really affect me in in the same way. Um, but the answer is, I don't know. You know, I uh, I, I know I know we should be wary of. Um, in the 60s, the guys who made um, Golden Sunshine, this LSD, they thought if, every, if they sort of um, spiked everyone with, this, with LSD, they would, soon there would be peace on earth and everything would be fine. Um, but they, just, they, were, you know, they discovered that didn't happen at all. I mean, they, okay, they didn't spike everyone, but those people who took it even didn't really go that way. So I don't think that's the solution. It's not simply a matter of giving people these things and thinking them that they'll turn into pacifist communists or whatever, whatever it may be. Also, like I said, I mean, you know, because psychedelics might take you away from a morality that even judges capitalism or communism or pacifism or whatever it may be, or militarism, you know. So um, I don't. Yeah. So basically, I don't know. Don't know the answer to that question. Sorry. I think it's an important question to be asking. It's probably it's one of the most important questions. Yeah, that's why it's just it's uh, multifaceted, and I I I, uh, I can't answer it. Thank you. Okay. Hello. I was just wondering. If it might be fair to say that um, the ancient Eleusinian mysteries might have been an archaic form of neo-nihilism. Do you think that's a fair uh, Ooh, right. statement? <laughs> <laughs> that, by the way, is um, Amanda, who, who does this great podcast called Silly Rabbits. She, she, um, she interviewed me once on that. I recommend it. Silly Rabbits. Silly with a P, of course. Um, what she asked was, uh, was the Illusion of Mysteries of, uh, sort of uh, a form of neo-nihilism? Well, neo-nihilism is uh, an essay in my book, Numenautics, and very harsh essay, uh, inspired a Marvel superhero, though, called Karnak, through Warren Ellis. I keep telling people that all the time. Um, but it's, um, it's, um, could the Eleusinian mysteries have inspired some, well, only in the sense, as I mentioned, that, uh, you know, it has its sense that it objectifies morality for one. Plato, of course, um, had a certain morality, you know, he talked about, you know, the sort of perfect individual um, or the perfect state should uh, mirror in the Republic the perfect individual. But we'd consider Plato's morality today to be quite, you know, immoral, really. I mean, you know, you know, he, he, he talked about slaves, you know, he had the Mino was about a slave boy who recognized the forms, uh, didn't criticize slavery. Um, he didn't, he thought democracy was pretty awful. Um, he, uh, I mean, Karl Popper wrote that Plato and Hegel were really responsible for the worst dictatorships of human history. So, so I, it would be hard today to say that um, the Eleusinian Mysteries might have inspired Plato's morality. Did it inspire his immorality, his nihilism? I don't, I don't, I don't think you could call him a nihilist. Um, but for me, at least, I would say that certainly, again, it, because psychedelics take me out of my culture, um, it makes me a little bit more Nietzschean in that sense, as the ultimate critic of Western culture, um, and leaves me, it can leave a person in a horrible moral abyss. Um, and it seems that the more I read, and the more things I take, the less I really believe in anything. Uh, but this is all, and it's uh, also horrific. Yeah. 
So there's maybe a danger of psychedelic use as well. I should. I haven't even mentioned, by the way, another. I mean, you know, you can have some. Even though psychedelics aren't. I mean, scientifically, they're they're not. Except in rare cases, they're not dangerous. But I mean, psychologically, I've had the most darkest, gothic, horrific trips. I've seen walls of skulls uh, surrounded by blue lasers and gone into glass elevators full of giant skulls and things like I mean, uh, wolves running towards me, multicolored furs and so on. I mean, all very cool, so I kind of appreciated it, really. But I, I can imagine that for certain people, I mean, if you've been brought up, for example, as a Catholic and you really believe in, you know, or at least you used to believe in demons, for example, um, that could be pretty it could be a life-changing event to see these things in real life as it were um so there is a danger there but um but like i say i, I do have sympathy for Paz's view with regard to nihilism and psychedelics yeah that doesn't mean of course it makes me immoral it just makes me kind of more apathetic <laughs> yes <laughs> but is that a bad thing according to what morality <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I have, um, so a lot of what we know about Socrates is through Plato, and yeah. some people uh, have said that it's hard to distinguish which is uh, written or created by Plato and which was created by Socrates. Yeah. And, um, and Plato has been often um, considered to have uh, been the inspiration for totalitarianism by some people. Do you think that Using um, the knowledge or the way of perception that we can get through psychedelics um, is a way to distinguish what is Platonic versus what is Socratic. Thank you. Um, God, that's, I've never, yeah, I've never thought about that. Let alone been asked it. Um, to those of you who don't know. Um, Socrates was a real philosopher who lived in ancient Greece and uh, he debated things with people in, on the street and whatever. Um, he, he was, he was, Plato was one of his students and Plato was ar an aristocrat. And um, uh, when Socrates died and he was killed by the state for allegedly spreading false rumors about the gods or questioning their existence, um, When he was killed, a number of students, including Plato, wrote dialogues, sort of repeating what he had said. And so it's generally believed that Plato's early dialogues were more authentic of what Socrates said. Socrates was often, you know, a protagonist within the dialogue. You know, Socrates said this, and then Glaucon said, yes, you're quite right, Socrates, blah, blah. And then as, as, as time went on, Plato's dialogues became more Platonic, and, you know, it's like his own thought really going into the voice of Socrates. Can psychedelics allow one to decipher whether Plato or Socrates was speaking in Plato's dialogues? I can't see how, how they could, unless, you know, unless some radical sort of time travel were involved or some kind of extremely transcendental knowledge somehow came, came through, but to my knowledge, I, I can't see how that's possible. But I, I might be wrong. I mean, you know, the, the, these, these are these deep metaphysical questions you, one can only speculate on, but I can't see any reason for that. Thank you. Hi, Peter. Can you see Hi. me? Yeah. Hi, my name's Dan, and I, uh, I'm not here with a philosophical question. I uh, suffer from major depression, and I understand from reading articles that in Europe, psilocybins have been somewhat effective in, in getting people some relief from, from the effects of depression. Can you steer me or... In any directions, so I can learn some more about that? Yeah, well, um, I know that Imperial College have done research on psilocybin and depression. Um, papers by Robin Carr-Harris, Chris Timmerman, um, David Knapp, Professor David Knapp, um, 
I mean, the, the, these early stage, early stage um, studies, well, they seem very promising. Um, also, MDMA, you know, the pure ecstasy drug, um, is currently being studied by people like um, Ben Sessa, a friend of mine, um, to see if it can treat, well, especially PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. But there, there seems to be indications that it's also um, could be useful for depression and OCD. But um, but the problem is because these because psilocybin is illegal still in Britain, um, it's really hard to get the money together to to study it. I mean, you know, you can pick a mushroom and it's free. In a field, in a garden, even, but to get it in the university, you're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of pounds in here, uh, just for a small amount. So, and and sometimes, of course, you won't necessarily get the license either. So, you know, the law of Britain, but also most country, Western countries, is really hindering, you know, um, the a real good source of potential, uh, you know, and radical um, possibilities for healing people with depression. So that's another reason why um, it should be, in my, re in my view, it should be really uh, people who, who uphold these prohibitions should be seen as kind of, you know, anti-health. And that, I mean, there was this case in Britain, I don't know if you, you saw it there in America, but a small child um, suffered epileptic fits um, and he wasn't allowed to bring into the UK his uh, cannabis uh, tablets which were allowed to believe in, in another country, Canada or Ireland. Anyway, um, there was such an outcry that this was not allowed because it was the only thing that worked for him, that the law changed in Britain. With it. I mean, now, you know, this was, I'm talking about this happened about half a year ago. And today, um, cannabis is now legal for medical treatment in Britain. And the reason was this public outcry. You can't, I mean, you can't, who could be against medicine? <laughs> it's just completely barney that uh, you could try to prohibit these things, uh, which have great potential to heal people. So I think, you know, um, slowly but surely people are realizing this, and that's why these prohibitions are, are being lost. And so I hope in 10 years there will be some new, you know, uh, pr uh, uh, prescription drug, really, for depression through psychedelics. But, you know, that's, that's of course, dependent on whether they really work. But, yeah, like, all I can say is, you know, the science is promising. Um, Imperial College, Bristol University, uh, both worthy of looking into. Um, also, the Beckley Foundation, who fund a lot of that. Um, their publications, um, like I say, it's not my field, medicine, but, you know, um, all I can say is hopefully within... Within a number, a few years, with less, fewer than ten years, I should think that there'll be something available. Mm -hmm. If you were to do it underground, you know, take it with a therapist. I mean, I mean, they, they, it does. They, I, apparently, there are uh, healers who who do who do this sort of illegally, you know, as it is illegal. Um, so maybe it's worth looking into that. But uh, as you know, risk. But I can just, you know, I can just hope for you that this will soon be soon be on the market. But then. Hey. The, the, or capitalist question then as well. So yeah, and also you know this old question is: Do you want to medit? I, th I think although I you know I'm hoping this will happen. I think it will happen. I think one danger as well is we shouldn't just see psychedelics as medicine. That is a great value for them, but they're much more than that as well. I mean they're also very valuable to the um, people who don't suffer mental uh, conditions. So they're they're really good for everyone, except Catholics maybe. <laughs> Hey. Hi. I wanted to ask, I mean, another question I've come across in philosophy of mind is like, to what extent is free will really free, and to, and to what extent is it kind of uh, an emergent neurochemistry and electrical processes in our bodies? And that question used to really bother me until psychedelics tell me we're all riding the crest of the time wave and it's always changing, and so there's always room for more creativity and new things. It's never the same twice, but I was that's just my intuitive feeling. Like, I was wondering if you read about that or thought about that in the context of psychedelics. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, the whole thing about mental causation, free will and determinism is not a philosophical question, but um, Whitehead, whom I mentioned before and Terence McKenna spoke about, I mean, he... Okay, first of all, this is not exactly about psychedelics, but he argued that when we think about determinism, we think, you know, there are laws of nature and everything must act according to those laws of nature. That's basically determinism. If we, And if, in theory, you know, we knew the position of all particles, we knew all the laws of nature, then we could predict exactly what was going to happen. So, therefore, there's no role for the mental to play in your actions. What Whitehead's great... I mean, Whitehead was a scientist, physicist, and a logician, and a mathematician, as well as a metaphysician later, but he said, listen, science only takes... This view is dependent upon... <clears throat> number one, that laws of nature don't change. This is Hume's old point, you know. Uh, why, how do we know the laws of nature? We see regularities in nature, and then we sort of think, well, those regularities that we've seen a number of times, uh, they are absolute, everlasting laws of nature. But of course we don't know that. I mean, we've only measured the speed of light, for example, for the last 200 years. I mean, like Whitehead with, says, maybe the speed of light fluctuates over millions of years. But of course, when we take a small fraction of that, we, and then we generalize it, we reify it, we, we come up with these eternal laws, which we've got no right to do. I mean, this is Hume's point as well. We've got no right to believe in determinism. You know, that we, it's just logically incoherent. Secondly, um, you know, Whitehead talks about these eternal objects, he calls them, the universals I spoke of, and they are infinite in number, and they, in, they ingress into our consciousness, um, and there's no, there's no limit to that. As they are infinite, there's no limit whatsoever. Secondly, um, for Whitehead, matter and mind are essentially the same thing that we split into two because of, number one, biology, number two, cultural inculcation. But they are the same thing. So all physical causality is mental causality, or the ultimate depth. And, and mental causality is basically free will. So really, there's no dichotomy um, between determinism and free will from, from Whitehead's system. And, and I am a, I would call myself a Whiteheadian. In fact, I'm coming to California to speak, to go to Whitehead Conference on Exceptional Mental States in March, in Claremont, California, where we'll be discussing this. And um, Whitehead's philosophy, I mean, if you haven't read it, I just, it's just so, it's like Nietzsche and Whitehead are the two philosophers for me who just sort of, um, you know, control or delete your mind and make you start again, you know, just question all the assumptions. Um, Whitehead's very, Nietzsche's quite relatively easy. Whitehead's quite difficult to read, but, when you get into him, when you start to understand how things fit together in his speculative metaphysics, uh, these questions, you, you, you begin to realize that a lot of these questions are pseudo-questions because they're based on false assumptions. So, yeah, I would just, I mean, look into Whitehead, um, Whitehead his notions of prehension, eternal objects, actual entities, and mental causation. Also, but just about mental causation quickly, something I would like to point out to people. F.H. Bradley, the idealist philosopher, Carl Popper, Say that um, if the mind had no power, then it would not have evolved. Uh, not only in humans, but in multiple species, presumably, and it wouldn't have maintained itself. Um, there's something in philosophy called Alexander's dictum, which is to, to exist as our power. It's actually from, from Plato, really, from the sophists. But um, if mental states had no power whatsoever, why did we ever evolve them? Also, that would mean that reasoning, calculating things, trying to work out Whitehead or Hegel or whatever, you know, completely pointless. There's, n there's just no, which, which just doesn't seem right. Your desire to get a cup of tea or a beer or whatever um, is completely uh, unnecessary. It just makes a mockery of the very existence of mentality. So linking that to psychedelics then, I mean, the very fact that we can talk about psychedelic experiences mean that the experience itself has had an effect on the physical body speaking, which is a form of mental causation. Now, perhaps we were determined, but we could not have been determined um, by pure matter. Um, yeah. And, uh, okay, and then the next question is, what do you mean by pure matter? That's probably an abstraction. Whitehead's great for that. What we understand by matter constantly changes through history, you know? I mean, you know, like what Democritus, Lucifer, Lucretius said was matter is not what we consider matter today. Um, this is just and what it means. And it's actually, if you, if, you, if you look into what matter means, it's very vague, you know, it's a very vague thing. Fiegel, huh? Fiegel's great to read on this. Physical and the mental. Um, so, you know, 
the fact is, we don't understand, again, it's the hard from consciousness, we don't understand the relation between matter and mind. So we are not in a position to say that, you know, free will doesn't exist. You can only say that when you know what the relation is. Nobody does. We know that's correlated. We know mind and matter is correlated. But that's the question, not the answer. Even if, if you had a perfect correlation between brain and mind, that still wouldn't tell you what the relation was. And we haven't even got the perfect correlation. I mean, there's even, there's this really interesting case called the Lorber case of a guy, a math student who had a high IQ at Sheffield University um, a few decades ago, in Britain here, a uh, high IQ, a uh, very sociable, friendly guy, had a bit of a big head, I mean, literally, um, went to <laughs> went to, uh, uh, had a brain scan, and they discovered he didn't have a brain. He had a thin film of neurons at the bottom of his skull. Yet he could function and perceive perfectly normally. Um, this is an anomaly that still can't be explained. So, um, so yeah, th that, so the mind-matter relation is already a mystery. When you take psychedelics, it becomes even more of a mystery. So we have to, we have to uh, maintain Gnosticism here. I'm going to read some whitehead, thank you. Yeah, and also, if you, if, if you do, the first book to read with whitehead is Modes of Thought. Modes of okay. Thought, I would suggest that. Start with by Alfred North Whitehead. Right. Well, if there are no more questions, or rather, um, I will say thank you. Oh, there is a question.